is our last day of actually talking about fairy tales. Um, we are going to dive into Russian fairy tales shortly. This week we are also covering Scandinavian stories. Last week we did French and Italian and the week before that we did German. But before we get into the content, I would like to take a moment and talk about fairy tale retellings because very soon you're going to have to decide how you want to create your own fairy tale retelling. I'm going to take a moment in the beginning of the Russian fairy tales PowerPoint, which you should pull up, to talk about that. So I've got some examples that I want to show you, um, which should also give you an idea of things you can do yourself. So one idea is To Kill a Kingdom by Alexandra Cristo, which I have right behind me, right here. It is a retelling of The Little Mermaid in which the mermaid's mother is the sea witch and the mermaid must kill the prince in order to win back her mother's approval. Uh, the mermaid does not lose her voice in, her, in this retelling, so some interesting changes already happening right there. Then we have Bitter Greens by Kate Forsyth, which is an adult novel that retells Personette, the French version of Rapunzel, while intertwining a biographical story about the author, Charlotte Rose de la Force. We have Girls Made of Snow and Glass, which I have over here just out of frame. That's a retelling of Little Snow White, in which Snow White is literally made from enchanted snow, and the evil queen is has a heart made from glass. Snow White is also a lesbian in this retelling, so we've got some queering stuff going on. It's great. We have Cinder from the Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. I have that. Oh, no, wait, I lent it to my next door neighbor. Never mind. By the way, it belongs right here on my shelf where the 510 retellings are. In the Lunar Chronicles, this is um, a series. Fairy tales exist together in a futuristic sci-fi fantasy world. Cinderella is a cyborg working as a mechanic. Red Riding Hood is a pilot. I have Scarlet up here. Rapunzel is trapped on a satellite. And Snow White is a slightly insane moon princess. It's a very enjoyable series. Um, I hope you enjoy it as well, if you choose to read it. Uh, then we have Briar Rose. Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is our last day of actually talking about fairy tales. Um, we are gonna dive into Russian fairy tales shortly. This week we are also covering Scandinavian stories. Last week we did French and Italian. But before we get into the content, I would like to take a moment and talk about fairy tale retellings because very soon you're going to have to decide how you want to create your own fairy tale retelling. So um, I'm going to take a moment in the beginning of the Russian fairy tales PowerPoint, which you should pull up to talk about that. So I've got some examples that I want to show you, um, which should also give you an idea of things to do yourself. So one idea is To Kill a Kingdom by Alexandra Cristo, which I have right behind me, right here. Uh, it is a retelling of The Little Mermaid in which the mermaid's mother is the sea witch and the mermaid must kill the prince in order to win back her mother's approval. Uh, the mermaid does not lose her voice in, her, in this retelling, so some interesting changes already happening right there. Then we have Bitter Greens by Kate Forsyth, which is an adult novel that retells Personette, the French version of Rapunzel, while intertwining a biographical story about the author, Charlotte Rose de la Force. We have Girls Made of Snow and Glass, which I have over here just out of frame. That's a retelling of Little Snow White, in which Snow White is literally made from enchanted snow, and the evil queen is has a heart made from glass. Snow White is also a lesbian in this retelling, so we've got some queering stuff going on. It's great. We have Cinder from the Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. I have that. 510 should be... I must have taken that one into the other office already. Oh, no, wait. I lent it to my next door neighbor. Never mind. By the way, it belongs right here on my shelf where the 510 retellings are. In the Lunar Chronicles, this is um, a series. Fairy tales exist together in a futuristic sci-fi fantasy world. Cinderella is a cyborg working as a mechanic. Red Riding Hood is a pilot. I have Scarlet up here. Rapunzel is trapped on a satellite. And Snow White is a slightly insane moon princess. It's a very enjoyable series. Um, I hope you enjoy it as well, if you choose to read it. 
Uh, then we have Jane Yolen. This novel uses Sleeping Beauty as a frame narrative for a grandmother's story of surviving the Holocaust. So we're seeing fairy tales used as a frame for storytelling. So that's one interesting way. Um, and here are a couple of tips I have for retelling. First of all, you can read other variants. Many are on Sur la Lune, um, which you have been linked to before um, for your um, fairy tales assignments. Um, explore what others have done to retell the story if they have done so. And think about context and symbolism. How does that translate to your retelling? And you're welcome to experiment thoughtfully with the content. Um, I have very little um, that I expect you to do. Um, I have mentioned this guy before, as has Marina Warner. This is Vladimir Prop. He wrote um, The Morphology of the Folktale, which is one of the most critical works in interpreting folktales. It was written in 1928. It wasn't translated into English until the 50s, but it was written in the 20s. Prope examined many of Afanasyev's fairy tales, and Alexander Afanasyev is like the um, Russian equivalent of the Grimm brothers, or as Björnson and Moe. He broke the stories down into 31 functions, or small plot pieces, which he claimed appeared in all folk tales to some degree. Functions, such as hero requires a magical agent, uh, can be omitted, but the functions always appear in the same order. Uh, so there, that, that constitutes a dominant theory in folktale research for a long time, and there are kind of two opposing schools, whether you go with Prope or whether you go with uh, someone like Claude Lévi-Strauss, who has a different approach. Um, nonetheless, we will constantly, in folktale studies, refer back to Prope um, as kind of one of the major scholars of the field. On the next slide, I have a little bit more about Alexander Nikolaevich uh, Afanasyev. In Russian, I have I have it written there. Um, they, of course, use the Cyrillic alphabet, so it doesn't look the same as it does in English. He was born in 1826 and died aged 45 in 1871. He was known as the Russian counterpart to the Grimm's, and his collection of Russian folk tales was published in eight volumes between 1855 and 1867. His political views kept him from professional success, but nonetheless, he contributed important works to Russian thought and literature. Before Afanasyev, much, not much study had been done on the folk beliefs of peasant Russia, so this constituted a very significant work. Let's jump in and talk about the stories. First, we have Vasilisa the Beautiful. You might recognize some of the plot elements from the group project that you just turned in last week. Uh, it is ATU 510A, which makes it related to Cinderella. Afanasyev considered this tale to symbolize the conflict between the sun, Vasilisa, the storm, the stepmother, and Cloud's stepsister. Uh, this is similar to a once popular theory in folkloristics called solar mythology, in which all stories were considered to point to cosmic explanations. So remember how the Grimm brothers thought that um, Folk tales were descendants of myth, and Andrew Lang thought they represented ritual, that sort of thing. Um, Afanasyev had a very similar um, theory going on here that um, folk tales usually um, represented some sort of cosmic um, explanation. That is, people didn't understand how the sun worked, so they wrote stories to explain it. We don't buy into this anymore because we believe that ancient peoples were just as intelligent as we are today and had plenty of means with which to explain uh, physical phenomena. And they didn't necessarily need to create characters or um, explanations. Sometimes they did for religious purposes, um, but it wasn't because they were not intelligent. It's because we always tell stories to communicate information. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, so here are some uh, discussion questions for you to think about while reading uh, Vasilisa the Beautiful or thinking about Russian folk tales. In what ways does the story resemble Cinderella? What are the major differences? And why do you think the story is still considered a Cinderella story? Do you agree with Afanasyev's theory about the symbolism in the story or do you find different meaning in it? Um, what folk elements and themes are familiar and which are new to you in this story? Now, uh, on to Koshe the Deathless. The uh, Russian word uh, besmyortny uh, literally translates to without death. If you break it down, uh, bes is without and myortny is death. 
So um, bes besmortni is without death. Uh, koshe has several meanings and usually refers to a military leader. The character appears in many folk tales um, and is said to derive from a Kuman leader named Khan Konchak, who may have lived for over a hundred years. This is one of those ways in which legend and folktale kind of show how they're related. He resembles characters such as Perot's Bluebeard and the Grimm's Robber Bridegroom. So he's kind of like a stock character that appears in a lot of Russian folk tales. And um, Baba Yaga, who appears in Vasilisa the Beautiful, is another example of one of these stock characters. She appears um, all over the place in folk tales. As for Baba Yaga, it's she's relatively ambivalent. She doesn't necessarily. Um, She's not necessarily entirely evil, but she's definitely not exactly good either. So she's kind of one of these ambiguous forces. Koshe is usually an antagonist. So some uh, discussion questions for you about Koshe the Deathless. Which folkloric motifs, motifs do we see throughout the tale? We see that prophecy plays an important role in this story, which we haven't seen before in many of the tales that we've read. So what do we make of this? Is this significant to a Russian context? Like, what are your thoughts about that? There's not necessarily a right answer here, but I just want to know what you're thinking about it. Koshe's death is hidden in an elaborate nest. How can we parse the symbols linking death to these animals and objects? Like, what do you think the connections are here? All right, and finally, we have the Kolob. But you'll recognize that this is basically the pancake. It's the gingerbread man, except um, our little character here is the Kolob, um, which is just kind of a little bread, a little bit of bread. Make sure to watch that on your own time. Like I said, um, the English subtitles are pretty bad, um, so you're not really gonna make any sense out of those. Um, but by watching, and paying attention, you'll still be able to understand exactly what's going on. I hope you enjoy that as a nice little palate cleanser from some of our darker stories like Vasilisa the Beautiful and Koshe the Deathless. That is the end of our discussion on the actual fairy tales that we are going to be reading. So now we're going to start moving into adaptations. Keep in mind a lot of the things that we have been discussing about themes and motifs and subtext um, and imagery and all of these things. Um, and pay attention to how they emerge again in adaptations. Which ones stick, which ones do not, and uh, how do we go about um, identifying adaptations, evaluating and analyzing adaptations as um, they come along. So next week we're going to jump right into Disney, uh, and then we're going to do a couple of different things with different films, stage musicals, and so on, all the way up until April when we start reading a contemporary novel as well. So I hope you enjoyed reading some of these fairy tales. Some of them you might have read for the first time. And I encourage you that if you're interested in more, reach out to me, maybe explore the Sur La Lune website. Um, it's an extremely valuable website. Um, and if you want to use any of these for your final research paper, let me know and I can give you some ideas to work with. So that's all for now. I will see you next week to talk about Disney. Mm -hmm.